Well, welcome to the community lecture series. First off, if you can all please sign in for our records. I would love that. You can include your email if you want to get on the email list if you're not already. If not, don't worry about it. So I'll pass this around. Thank you all for coming, even though it's nice out. Um, we also like to thank Prince William Sound Science Center, Education Department, the Alaska Sea Grant, the Audubon Society, Forest Service, and Prince William Sound Community College for helping us put this on. Um, tonight we have David Rosenthal. He's going to be talking about how science has influenced his artwork. He was originally from Maine, but he's been out here in Cordova since 1981, and he's been all over the place in Antarctica and Greenland working on his art. Okay, thank you. Computer protect the screen save on you. <laughs> we waited too long. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh, oh. Momentarily, we were. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I curse without all the time. curse with computers. <laughs> I forgot to, to warn Molly about that. <laughs> That's this is a, an old main painting, and I wanted to start with it because it's, uh, it's kind of important to see where I came from and to uh, see the difference between where I started and where I ended up. But what I'd like to do while this is just up there as wallpaper is explain a little bit about my start in drawing and painting. And, uh, also my early interest in science because that's kind of what this lecture is about. It's, it's about how science has influenced my work and it's influenced it tremendously. Uh, when I started, when I was in high school and, and then in college, I started studying physics and if you had told me I was going to be an artist, I would have laughed. You know, I would have thought that was pretty funny because not only didn't I want to be an artist and wanted to be in science, be a physicist or something, but I also had a very negative view of art because back then art seemed to me to be this endeavor where people did a lot of far out things and very pretentious and so I, I had no interest in art. But I also didn't study as a student in physics and Eventually, I plunked out of school and ended up, just for the fun of it, starting to draw a little bit with pen and ink first, you know, brushing. And it was with no intention to be an artist, or it's not because I loved art, but I started to draw, I think, because I had a real love of nature. When I was growing up, I always loved to be out in the fields and running around, you know, out in the woods and so on. And I just really liked nature. And so when I started to draw, I naturally started to draw things that I liked, which was the natural world. And when I started, I didn't actually draw the natural world. I didn't go out in nature and sit there and draw things that I saw. I just drew what I remembered. And in Maine, that worked really well because in Maine, everything's a little fuzzy. And so I could, I could be outside for a while and see different trees and different fields and so on. And I could come home and I could, out of my memory, draw these things together and create a scene that would look sort of like a real place. Because, like I say, in Maine, there was a lot of places that looked very similar. And then when I started to actually paint, I would do things like this, which is the same thing, where I would take and see a bunch of different things and I would just put them all together and create a, a scene out of my head. And like I say, you know, in Maine, it, everything's fuzzy like this, and I would actually have a show of painting similar to this and people would come up to me and they'd say, how did you get in my backyard or, you know, or that, I know where that is and so on. And it had, they weren't real places. But one thing that strikes me now after all these years is that these, place, these paintings are sometimes kind of pretty scenes 
but they don't really have a sense of place because I, they aren't re a real place. And so what happened was that, you know, I started to realize this and, and I started to, to uh, look at the work I was doing and realize that, that I needed to do something different if I wanted to see the way things really were. And so it was right around that time I actually moved, uh, started coming up to Cordova. And this is a scene looking out towards the flats. And I just vaguely can remember that this might have been Sheridan Mountain and that area out there. But this was just done from memory. It's a pastel because they were portable. My first or my second season up here working at the processors, I used to I brought pastels because they were portable. In my free time, I would go and, and look at the scenery, and then come back and and uh, make these paintings. But these this once again has no sense of place. There's no this isn't a real place. But the so when I got to Alaska. I changed a lot of things. I changed this, I started, it dawned on me that it doesn't work to just look at things and then go home and try and recreate it because things are very specific, you know. In, in Maine, you've got a bunch of hills that could be anywhere in Maine, but here you've got Mount Eccles and Mount Eccles looks like Mount Eccles. You can't, you can't just generalize and, and create a mountain that because it's no place and there's no sense of place. And this is a this is when I first started to draw. And this is Heaney Meadows. And you can actually see Robert Korn and the the uh, uh, bench on Baldy and so on. And it's not as accurate, but it and and the painting, the the actual execution of the painting isn't all that great. But you, you do get more of a sense that this could be a real place. It's distinctive enough, and it's in, I think a lot of people might recognize it. This is a, a little scene, and this is where the science comes in. Because I didn't say, oh, I'm interested in science. I'm going to start using, I'm going to start doing art that's based in science. I mean, it wasn't that kind of a decision. Like I say, it was more a matter of I loved the natural world. I wanted to express what I felt about it. And so I just started to draw and paint. But the sci this idea in science where you figure out how things work, you know, that's what's really made a huge difference in my work. You know, I, I think about how does the light work and how does it reflect off the surfaces. And so this is this painting I, I often point to as where I really started to learn to paint. And you can see the surface of the snow as opposed to the one just before. The surface of the snow gives you the impression of these kind of rolls and dips in the snow. It actually looks like snow going back in the distance in some lighter areas and that you know reflect it. And it all has to do with figuring out how light its surfaces and is reflected to our eye. And so this is where I really started to, without thinking about it, I really started to use the science background because I learned to try and figure things out. I also figured out on this, by trial and error, uh, that I needed to use mediums with my paint and layer paint on rather than just those early paintings were just done with one sitting. I would just put the paint on all in one layer. And of course, they weren't very realistic because of that, and a lot of detail was lost. I found that if, if I took the paint right out of the tube like I used to and tried to do any detail or do any blending, the paint you know, would form these furrows and all this, you know, all this texture that I didn't want. And it dawned on me that I had this stuff called linseed oil in my paint box that I had no clue what it was for, but I just happened to be there. And it was, I started to add that to thin, to thin the paint, and then I could do this fine blending that you can see along the edges and so on, 
and create this effect. So it was kind of that, and here's a painting not long after that, and you can see how the snow is all mottled, you know, it's molded sort of in the paint, and it creates this feeling of space and solidness, and, and also it, uh, it has a sense of place once again. It's, it's, it's a real place. Anybody who's been up in the meadows, you know, in the winter or sometime or spring, would you know have this thing would would understand this scene and then of course here's little mummy island <laughs> there's some weird stuff going on with the pixels and that's probably my uh doing when i prepared these images but but at any rate and this this is a a great example of Anybody in Cordova would know this place would, and would understand this. And, and I've painted Little Mummy Island dozens and dozens of times, and I never get tired of it because the light always changes and, and the atmosphere. This is a great example of a, this is a very early painting that I did. And I went up to Baldy, the peak next to Mount Emi, and I'm looking down at the uh, either the Eak River or, or Mountain slew, I forget which. But at any rate, you can see all this detail in the flats and and that I could not do that from memory, you know. But because I took and I drew this scene, it really looks like that place and it, it has that feeling that, you know, this is this is real. And this is a a large painting that I did. Uh, from up at that same, up on top of Baldy, looking off towards Mount Tom White and the Sheridan Glacier. And it just, you know, once again, I could never just do this from memory. I had, I had to go up there. As a matter of fact, I made about seven or eight hikes up there to do the drawings that I would use for this painting. Where is that painting? Pardon? Who has that painting? This was commissioned, this was my first commissioned by the Anchorage uh, uh, the municipality of Anchorage commissioned it for their bus barns. I don't know if anybody's been there, but they're those, they're great buildings. They look like buses stood on end. They're out on Tudor Road. And this was the percent for art commission. And it was really amazing because I, I applied for this. I sent them a, a crude drawing of what I would do. And they said, sure. And this is a four and a half by five foot painting. There are parts in that, like in the Sheridan uh, Lake there, there's icebergs floating that I had to see with binoculars. To, and I put in this painting. I mean, it's a large scale painting with a lot of, a lot of little things in it. This painting here is from the Nushigak River. I was tendering out uh, in Bristol Bay and we had done Tokiak herring, and then we had to anchor up in the Nushigak River waiting for the, the Bristol Bay uh, salmon season to start. And I used to have to sit on anchor watch for four hours at a time and just look at the river and the weather coming and going. And then I'd go back to my stateroom and I'd work on this painting. I'd put another layer on this painting. Then I'd go back up to Anchor Watch and look at the river and say, oh, is that what it really looked like? And then I'd go back down and work on it. So there was 20 to 30 layers of, of uh, paint on this river, you know, that make what are called transparent layers that are called glaze layers. And this taught me how to do water. I, I learned how to use these transparent layers of the oils to, to create these effects and make water look like it's water. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, some of the, the result of that. This is a painting of water lilies and you can see the transparency of the water and I, I won't go into all the details of how it worked but it was kind of a magic painting where I, I did this in three sittings and it was, you know, I still remember it as uh, a magic painting that I'd love to be able to do that again. But I basically I had the glaze on this painting, and each one of those stems that seemed to disappear into the water 
was I just loaded a brush with some green paint and I just drew them down into the glaze and they, the paint came off into the glaze until there wasn't any left. And voila, there's, you know, there's this feeling that they're going into the water, you know. And so I learned how to use these glazes to, to create paintings and it's, uh, and it was all trial and error. And, and I attribute the fact that I could figure these things out and use this trial and error because that's, you know, my early interest was in science. And, and so to me, even though I've never been a scientist, I feel that that scientific method of investigating things and knowing that there's a reason for things and so on has allowed me to do my own investigation, my own science. And, and this is Crater Lake. And once again, you can see the transparency of the water using the glazes. And, uh, and then this is the, in this painting is my, I call this the best painting I ever did. <laughs> and there's, and unfortunately it was 30 years ago. And I've still been trying to, to top it. But here there was easily 30 layers of transparency on the, the on this water. And so you're looking into the water at this refracted light on the rocks there. And, <clears throat> and then you're looking into the deeper and deeper water and then you start seeing the ripples and then you see the far shore and then the brightness attracts you back to the bright area and then you do the same thing. It becomes like, it's like mesmerizing, it's better than TV, you know. So, at any rate, this was this was the result of this observation because I sat there at the shore and if you tried to photograph the same scene and you you would just get this kind of glow of kind of a reddish glow on the rocks because you'd have to either focus on the reflection on top or you'd have to focus on the bottom and you can't do that with the camera but as a painter I realized that I can paint the reflection on top and also paint the what's going on in the bottom of the water you know so there's I started to learn there's advantages to being a painter to create scenes that are more real than what photographs are. They're not more accurate, but they're more real in the sense that that's how we see it. Somebody looking at this painting would recognize it as how they see this very same scene. Where is that painting now, the one before? Oh, that one? Yeah. I actually, years ago, I donated it to the to UAF, to the museum up there, and because I, I wanted it to be in a museum, you know, it was, and I don't know if it was a good idea, it was, who knows if it ever gets seen, you know. But I also sh should mention around this time, uh, when I was working on this painting, or a little bit earlier, I read an article, and here again my interest in science was invaluable to me because I always, would read articles on science and instead of, you won't see any art, any magazines about art in my house, they're all Scientific Americans or Science News or New Scientists. And, you know, so I've always read about science and I came across an article and it was in Scientific American and it was called The Retinex, the Retinex Theory of Color Vision by Edwin Land. And if anybody knows uh, anything about or remembers Polaroid land cameras, he was the guy who invented it. And he wrote this article. His theory was that if you take between your eyes seeing something and your cortex, in between those two places, there was a lot of processing of images being done. And so he came up with this term retinex, meaning between the two of them, you know, the retina and the cortex, there's, that's where the image processing is done. And he, in this article, which is a great article, uh, it talked about how we created images, or how we, how we perceive color in our minds. And I won't go through the whole article, but, but basically it taught me that 
you don't get colors by going to the store and buying a tube of paint. You create colors in people's minds because you, you know, you, to get any particular color, you have to paint all the other colors around it to look like it's the color you want. And so the first thing that struck me about this article was it explained why when I went and bought all kinds of tubes of blue and I made all these blue swatches, I could never match the blue of a glacier. I couldn't match the, the blue of a winter day coming in the, the window. You know, it just, the blue would look drab. But after reading this article, I realized that, well, I just have to, I have to look at this painting as its own little world, and then I had to paint all the other colors to bring out that blue, and that works, because I'm using people's minds to create the color. I'm not trying to just find a pigment that reflects the right colors. And this, this painting and all the other paintings to come, I started to use this, these concepts. And uh, so this is where, if I hadn't been interested in science, you know, I'd still be looking at those books on color that you get when you look at art stuff. And, you know, and, and it's really meaningless for my purposes. For design and so on, it might be valuable. But, but for trying to recreate what we see in the real world, especially color, you have to understand that you're creating the color in people's minds. This, I started to do a lot of artist in the school residencies, and I'll just go through these fairly quickly. But this is up in Anaktubic Pass, and this is uh, part of the triptych. This is in the morning looking up the pass up to the north slope. This is in the afternoon looking in the same direction from a little higher. And this is the evening. This artist in the schools program really, really, uh, gave me access to a lot of great places in Alaska. And this, this shiny water, I like to point out, is even though it has to do with light, the creation of light in the painting, I also owe this to this redneck's theory of color vision. Because, in fact, if I wanted to create a real bright light like that, I had to arrange the other colors and the other values, as they're called in the arts, of darks and lights are called values, I had to arrange them in such a way to bring out that white. And that bright white is the only pure white in this painting. All the white snow is actually a light blue. And so as a result, it, it comes across as being the brightest thing, so our mind interprets it as real bright light on the water. I also contrasted it with the dark, dark bushes right there. And so, so I'm constructing the light and the color by thinking in terms, in scientific terms, about how, how they're created in the brain. This is, a, this is up by Kaktovic. And here the perspective comes into play with the, the converging lines in the snow. It's real subtle that it creates this big space because of this using the perspective and these converging lines. This is looking the exact opposite direction at the same time as that other one. But in this direction, the, the sun was in that direction. It had been, I'd been looking at the sun, actually, but it was in the fog. In this direction, the sun was setting and lighting up the fog and the snow. This is up by, you know, the sea ice up by Kaktovic, and that's a mirage. And that mirage, you know, once again, when I would look at these things, I would, it was really good to be able to go and, and figure out just how it's produced. And my theory is, and I'm not, I don't have any actual proof, but I think I was looking at a mirage of sea ice that was far enough away, maybe a hundred or more miles, that the sun was setting, and so the sun was setting on that sea ice, and then the image is, is bent across the horizon, so those structures in the distance, which are mirage, have that golden cast to it of the sunset. 
even though where I am, the sun hasn't set yet. It was close. But this is uh, that Kaktovic Lagoon, they call it, right near there. And then there's this Point Hope, some sea ice. And this is some more sea ice up by Point Hope. And I like to point out that it's all sea ice, but look how different it is. But even being different, both of these have that sense of sea ice and a sense of a real, real place. And this is up by recognition, uh, just a kind of a ice mist on a bright and sunny day. And these are the, what are called the red hills looking over towards Keller. And these are the red hills in autumn looking out towards Port Clarence. And Then I, uh, I was also affected by science in a way that I never would have expected. I got to ride on a Coast Guard icebreaker, and a couple times actually, and it turns out that a lot of their missions are science support. And so I got to ride along, and I got to go to some amazing places, including the Northwest Passage, and this is Devon Island on the Northwest Passage. Uh, and Greenland and so on, because I was kind of tagging along on the science infrastructure, which, and I had no inkling that I would be using it so much as my career progressed. This is up by Ellesmere Island, and this was, this was kind of a funny one because I had, I had been in, on this icebreaker, and we were up at uh, Thule. We had broke ice for these. Uh, resupply vessels to the base up in Thule and we had to wait for the tanker to unload and the, for the the green wave, the cargo ship to unload and the captain, you know, it was great being the artist because the captain, you know, said on this, uh, it was actually Polar Star, if you know about the Coast Guard icebreakers, uh, this, the captain said, well, let's go Let's go and see if we can get up way up north so the artists can see stuff. You know? So I had a 400 foot ship, you know, taking me, and this is as far north as we could get because obviously the captain couldn't justify trying to break this kind of multi year sea ice uh, and where, you know, it would be a lot of wear and tear. But, but that's Ellesmere Island right there, and Greenland was just off to the other side. Then on another trip with the Coast Guard, uh, we were escorting a science vessel that wanted to freeze in as far north as it could, north of Spitsbergen, and so we actually uh, made it to about 80, almost 83 degrees north in the polar ice cap up above Spitsbergen, and this was in September, the minimum extent of the ice, and so I got to, when the when we'd stop, I'd get to go off the ship and wander around on these ice flows. And, and this was, this painting was all about that little green coming through this sea ice, that little bit of green light. And of course we saw lots of icebergs and, and mist. And this is the coast of Greenland. And then I ended up going to work down in Antarctica at first as a contract employee, just being uh, support personnel. And right at that same time that I went, it took me two years to get a job down there doing this. And I also had heard about they have an artist and writers program. And I applied to that for, well, three years unsuccessfully. And it was on my fourth application I got to be the official artist. And this is looking across at Ross Island, and that's where, that's Hut Point Peninsula, and McMurdo Station is right there, and that's Mount Erebus, you can just barely see it, Mount Terra, and Terra Nova. But here, you know, the whole reason for this Antarctic program was to support the National Science Foundation. And it was uh, great for me because first, as when I started working there, 
I was just a laborer, but I soon found a better job after my first year down there where I was working in science support. So occasionally I get to go out with the scientists in different places. I get to go out to work on uh, some of the science huts and so on. And this was up on Erebus itself, looking at Mount Bird and up to Smith Island. And this is Mount Erebus, and this this was this is a great example of this color uh, that I was talking about, as well as this perspective where it I started to learn about how to create color because I wanted to get this bright red. But if you just add white to red, like people think, you know, it turns pink. It doesn't turn bright saturated red. It turns kind of a dull pink. And so what I ended up doing was, is, as you can see, is all the red, the red is the brightest thing in this painting. And if I had put even a small mark of white paint in this painting anywhere, that red would look instantly dull. Because within that painting, it's, it's all, uh, your eye does this thing where it compares everything in the painting and decides what's the brightest thing and then sees it as light or dark on that basis. So by surrounding all the red with these kind of darker blues and greens, it seems to glow just like I saw when I was there. The other thing I point out on this is that if anybody photographed Mount Erebus, they always ended up with this photo of this little lump on the horizon. It was just, it would, and they'd always be disappointed. But this is how we'd see it. And so, I was very fortunate that I was stubborn and I only worked from drawings because when I would draw it, I wouldn't exaggerate it consciously, but I drew it exactly as I saw it. And then the net result was, that's what we see. And it turns out we exaggerate relief when we're looking at things. You know, just like when we're skiing, we exaggerate the slope, you know, and so on. We always take and, and uh, you know, we do these, our mind isn't a camera. It doesn't, it doesn't not just objectively take a picture and have everything uh, the way it really is. You know, we, we have these, these mechanisms in our perception that make us see things differently. This is three weeks before sunrise, White Island. This is an aerial view of the Vincent Massif, the high point of Antarctica, where I was traveling with some scientists, and, and they wanted to go and do a recce flight, as they called it, on one area. They couldn't, it was cloudy, so they asked the pilot, they said, well, can we go, go see the Vincent Massif? And so we flew around the Vincent Massif, just sightseeing with the C-130 for about 40 minutes. This was another trip on a recce with, a, with some scientists. And this was a, in, from a C-130. And they were doing this reconnaissance. And they dumped some fuel barrels with a parachute. And as we uh, were flying around, they, they opened the back and dumped these, these uh, fuel things out the back. And they kept the back door down. And they let everybody take a turn with the, you'd have a strap into what they call the gunner's belt, and then you could walk out on the back of the C-130 at about, I don't know, 12,000 feet or so. And, and you had all of Antarctica out there. And it was, you know, so when it was my turn, I just happened to luck out. The, the aircraft had basically flown in front of this mountain and then turned directly from it. And so this was my view. And so I quickly did some drawings and ended up with, uh, I call this my archival or archetypal painting. If you tell a little kid to draw a mountain, this is what you get, you know. It's just in our heads. This is Antarctica. And 600 million years ago, I guess it was attached to the American Southwest, according to the scientists down there. And this is a an ice fall. This was about a 7,000 foot drop from the top of this ice fall to the lower ice fall, bottom of the lower ice fall. 
and this is uh, the upper right valley, uh, and that's Lake Banda, and that little stream there is probably the only river in Antarctica. It's called the Onyx River, and it runs for about two months. And then closer to me is the labyrinth, they call it, and that weird-looking uh, mound there, that's called the Dias. And this is an ice fall that would have been right to the left of that if I turned around. But this is a, about a 2,000 foot drop. It's like a couple miles across and uh, the water just kind of, I mean the ice just comes across like a waterfall and then it puddles up down below. And this is in the morning on late winter. I was fortunate because I was doing science support and I got to go out at this time of year, which no one usually gets to do, and get to see this with the sun rising at the end of winter on the Upper Right Valley. And this is a, a dry valley lake, small lake, and just a typical scene. I sometimes say uh, some of these paintings, they could almost be just gravel pits or something, but they they do have a real sense of place to me. And this was a moonlit trip out to the dry valleys. And this is, I got to do this because I was the official artist on this particular winter. And this is another view of the the dry valleys. Then I got to go down as the artist down to Palmer Station and ride around on the research ship. And it was, I've always had uh, some of my uh, best fans for my artwork have been scientists, and they, they usually were very accommodating. The scientists themselves would invite me out to go with them to different places. And, and they would like my artwork because it showed a real place that they had been, they had, that they had a connection to. This was a large iceberg that was actually just a little piece of an iceberg the size of Rhode Island that had bumped along for about 50 miles and dropped these small pieces all along the way. This is from right up above Palmer Station, and now this has totally changed. Uh, that whole, that little wall there is, has been calved and melted through so now that doesn't even exist and all to the left of it is all melted you know it's global warming when I when I used to talk to the scientists my first year down there about global warming none of them would would ever stick their neck out and say it's happening you know they'd always say well maybe you know there's some evidence but by the time I, the last trip down there, they were all on board that yeah, something's happening. All you have to do is spend some time in Antarctica. But here, again, I like to point out that it's because of this idea that there's a reason for things that I can paint these things. You know, this idea that there's science behind what I'm seeing. And in this case, the, the real reflected water, which is grease ice on these small swells, the grease ice makes it real reflective. It's looked almost like mercury. And then these small swells that were coming into this bay, one side was reflecting the bright orange color from the clouds, and the other side was reflecting the greens on the, on the other part. And so it made this real scintillating surface of, of, this, of the green and orange. And it helps to understand this stuff to paint it. You know, it's, and so I owe that to looking at things in a scientific way. This is an iceberg sitting out there, and, the, and that's grease ice that's real reflective, and then the darker water is all disturbed water. Then I tried to do some mountain climbing, and I got cerebral edema at about 16,000 feet, so I never got up to the top of the valley, but I got some good views along the way. This is Mount Foraker. And here again, you can see I got that feeling of the ice limping with light from this idea that I painted everything else 
all the other snow is actually kind of a light blue. You know, it all comes back to this concept of you're creating the light and color in people's minds. It's not because I have some special white that's brighter than any other white. It's because of the way I use it. This is the end of the Ice Age, I call this one. And I got to go back up to Greenland as a science tech up on the ice cap. And fortunately, I got stuck in August uh, down on the coast waiting for weather and got to do a little bit of exploring around Kangalusak. And here you can actually see the, you can see the, the, the way the ice has been retreating. And so right here, it's retreated earlier so that it's vegetated, then it's gravel, then it's just ice covered with moraine, with dirt, and so on, and then it's ice cap. And of course, this ice cap extends all the way up to, to the ice cap. And so I, I spent about three and a half months up on the ice cap itself doing uh, light kind of science. It wasn't real. I was a science tech, but I was working with a woman who had a PhD and she was a real science tech. So I would take data and climb towers and dust the frost off of instruments and so on. But it, it was a way to get up to the ice cap and, and spend a bunch of time looking at the scenery, which up there, the scenery was all about the sky, obviously, because the snow was, it's, it was about 10,600 feet up there. The snow, we took snow machines one day 25 miles from the camp, and the GPS said we were three feet higher than where we have been. It's so flat. But the sky was always spectacular. This was the morning we got picked up for our change, the crew change, and it was 60 below ambient temperature with a 15 knot wind the sun was going to come up for just an hour. That's why they do the crew change at that time. It's just some other sunsets. It was just beautiful, the sky. This was a moon dog up there. And then I came back here, and uh, I fortunately, <coughs> I had applied for a Rasmussen grant, and they, uh, I was selected for one, it was the first go around, and so I decided to use the money to travel to some places that I hadn't been. This is Mount Stellar to the east of us, and I went out there to do some ice skating and, of course, drawing. This is out there, too. This is Bear Vitas Lake, or Vitas Lake, and there's the Bering Glacier. You can just see the, some, the faces of the ice kind of yellow in the sunrise. And that's the ragged mountains. But this is sort of looking back for this world. And then from the Auklet, Dave Jenkins' boat, I actually uh, I also hired the boat for with some of this Rasmussen money. And then in years later, I actually went out and worked on it as a deckhand and washed dishes. And uh, as a way to get out there, as well as I hired it once again, this about two or three years ago. And it's been a great platform to see some beautiful scenery out in the sound. And of course, a lot, you know, some of these trips that I went out on were, were the result of uh, science cruises. Or, you know, so once again, I was kind of tagging along on science uh, infrastructure. Just out in, out in uh, Columbia Bay. This is a watercolor I just wanted to show because at some point I started doing watercolors for studies. And so this is a watercolor out of Columbia Bay. And this is the resulting oil. So what I do is I draw something, and then many times I'll do a study. I think I did this study actually out on the boat and then I turn it into oils. I'll go through, I might do 20 or 30 studies and I'll go through them and when I get home and decide which ones I should do in oils. That's another view. This is the sunrise one morning. 
in the same morning. And this is Columbia Bay. This was a this was a, a trip that Dave invited a bunch of us out on, and because Columbia Bay had actually become open and we could come real close to the base, and this was late afternoon on late summer day. And then, of course, I always been doing some traveling around Alaska. This is Blueberry Lake over by Thompson Pass, or in Thompson Pass. And this is up in the Brooks Range. Uh, about three or four years ago, I did a trip up there. This is the Brooks Range Valley. This is uh, out of Chignik Bay. This was actually a, an artist in the school trip. And this stream was at dusk. This is the same scene about three weeks later at sunrise. This is Saddlebag. People from here will remember it, although now the glacier face is, is way further up there. Whoops. But I like to point out that another advantage of this this idea of science, um, you know, that I had from had looking at the world from basically a perspective that's related to science, was that I started to learn to just observe, and I would paint things the way they really are, because it's like in science you don't you don't go and and decide on how things are and then observe and confirm what you decided. You go and you look at things and you try and see the way things really are. And by doing this with my work, I, I quickly learned that I don't have to worry about things like composition and all these, you know, aesthetics that are, you know, have to be related to some social agenda or whatever that, you know, you get from the art world. I just had to observe the world the way it really was and try and and paint it the way that I really saw it. And the result would be good composition because it's nature. And nature, I believe, is where good composition comes from. And then the only thing that was determined on, on what I would paint would be what I felt was important and what I wanted to, to paint. And no matter what I did, it would be good composition as long as I painted it faithfully. This is a real recent painting from last autumn of the Copper River with the dust and, and looking down at the what remains of the flow of the Copper River. This is a springtime flag point. People recognize that. David, when you're talking about composition and how you don't have to pick it, don't you feel like that where you put those edges, though, is an important choice? Like if this painting, that mountain peak you didn't give me, it might be a little more boring. Well, yeah, no, you're you're right, but that's that's what I that's why I say I don't choose it because I'm not I'm not making a decision based on oh that mountain peak would make it look good or that you know having that little peninsula would make it look good. I'm saying that I choose a scene because I sit out there and I draw. And what attracts my attention is, is what I, I draw. And I just, I, at this point, I don't even consider the, the, the whole notion of, oh, is this going to be a good composition? And in fact, uh, on a lot of paintings, I break the rules of composition. And they're some of my best paintings, you know, the, the, because they're just rules created by this, you know, general consensus that, oh, you've got to have a center of attention just slightly off the center, you know, and so on. I mean, it's, it really has nothing to do with, uh, you know, what I'm doing. But, you know, so, so composition doesn't matter to me. It's true, you might say that I am selecting these scenes, but, but I do like to make it clear that it's not because of some aesthetic agenda that I have. It's a matter of this is what I saw. And naturally, things that are more important to me will be a better, you know, will be fine as far as composition goes. 
in other words, I would believe that if I had just taken and done this right here, it still would be fine as far as composition goes, but it wouldn't have everything that I wanted to put in the painting, say. You know, any, I mean, if I just did this, that little area, that'd be fine for composition. It's just that it wouldn't be as meaningful to me as the whole thing. So. This is Miles Glacier. And this is Miles Lake. And this is a recent one from last fall of Sheridan River. This is looking up the north of the Sheridan River. Here's a sun dog. And everybody thinks that I just spend a lot of time skating and not working. But in fact, I'm working when I go out and skate. You know, this is some of the scenery to me is just beautiful. And here again. This is from last year. And I, like, I do like to point out that because I observe and I try to put things faithfully, you know, I've seen a glaciologist has looked at this and gone, oh, look at the trim line, you know, and so on. I mean, there's things in there that are recognizable. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Antarctica, I once had a scientist, he looked at one of my paintings from the dry valleys. And he goes, oh, I could use that in my textbook because it showed the way that the, the sandstone spalls because there's this little bacteria that he was studying that grows one half inch under the surface of the rock. And it grows only when the, the sun is on the rock enough to bring the temperature up a little bit above freezing. And it weakens the rock. And then the rock spalls off eventually. And so it forms certain patterns in the sand, in the sandstone, and you know he immediately recognized, and it's because I observed carefully. But he, he goes, oh, I could have used that for you know a textbook. And a lot of times I do two scenes that are really related. Believe it or not, this is a different painting, but it's from almost the same place. And the same with these two paintings. These are recent ones from last winter. And it almost looks like the same place, but they're actually a quarter mile apart, and the moraines are just very similar. And this, of course, is Sheridan Glacier. And this is just some moraines at, a, at sunset. And of course, when I ski, I'm also working. This is just up on the ridge, of, on Wolverine Ridge. And that's the backside of Mount Eccles, and looking out to the to Prince William Sound, or Gainland and Prince William Sound. And this is another from skiing. Another ski trip. And this is up by Crater Lake. This is that little pond before you get to Crater Lake. Uh, the day that the clouds were just low enough that they were skimming across the, the pass there. And this is an example of the drawings that I use. This is the drawing for this painting that I'll show you. That, uh, this drawing is like a shorthand. And it just tells me where the light is. And it tells me where the mountains are in relation to the Copper River and so on. And it's not meant to be detailed, because it's just to catch the overall feeling of the scene. And then, then I spend a lot of time doing these detailed drawings. You know, I could spend hours just doing the details for the actual painting. And then this is when I start to paint a painting, I put on a layer called an underpainting. And it's just, I rough in everything and I establish the lights and darks right from the beginning. 
and then I keep working on it by applying more layers, and each layer gets more detail. And there's actually a sequence of six or seven layers at least. But this is the finished painting right here. It kind of looks weird with the pixels doing this, but this is the Cordova Museum. We just bought this one with Rasmussen funds. And that's, of course, looking, you can see uh, Child's Glacier coming out in front of Mount um, O'Neill. Uh, that was last spring. Uh, that just, picture, do you do that in the field? So, uh, the yeah. pencil drawing? The pencil drawings I only do out in the field. You know, I don't, I, uh, you know, I don't work from photos ever, which is an example of just me being stubborn that it's been really, it's been the key to my work. It's why my work is, you know, what it is, is because I don't copy photos. I do the drawings. And they were back to this. But I do want to mention, since we get a couple minutes since we started late, I do want to mention some more things about this uh, kind of tie with the, with the science community as well as the environmental community. Uh, last spring I was invited to go talk at the Sierra Club, or I'm not sure who sponsored it, but a bunch of environmental organizations had a thing about, you know, the, the uh, 50th anniversary of the, of the, uh, the Wilderness Act, where they set aside places to just be wilderness. And I was invited to talk about, you know, what effect the wilderness had had on my, you know, or the environment had had on my work. And of course it was somewhat obvious, but it made me think about this. Because, you know, a lot of times we question, or some people might question, well, why do you want to preserve some place, you know? And, and, you know, then no one can go there, or it's hard to go there, or whatever. And, you know, and so then there's a lot of pressure to make it pay its way, you know, that the environment has to pay its way somehow, you know, and, and so on. And I, of course, looked at it from the standpoint of how important it's been to me that you have these protected places. And I, I talked to some people, and, and uh, where I, I talked about at this lecture that I had started out in Maine just painting the scenery there. And to me that was kind of my wilderness, I thought it was anyways. And of course later on when I came to Alaska I started to realize that Maine was just had been totally dissected with roads and had been, you know, any woods that I looked at had probably been cut over two or three times in its history. You know, there was almost no natural environment left in Maine. And when I got to Alaska, I started to realize there's, there's all, this, all this beautiful natural environment. And when I started to paint it, I started to realize that there is a sort of, sort of an order in nature. And, and, and that's what I'm really trying to paint, is this kind of natural order. And so it's great having these places that are real like that, you know, they're, they're not, they're not parks that are manicured and, and controlled and, and uh, you know, uh, made suitable for people. It's just real nature. And so I, I, I described how important that was to my work because it's formed the way I see my paintings as well as the way I see uh, nature. And so that's why I, I, you don't see man-made structures very often in my paintings. You don't see, I don't try to impose man's presence on the environment. You know, I'm interested in nature, and I'm interested in real nature, and I hope that, you know, in this little talk that I did over there, I hoped I conveyed that, you know, it's a great thing to have this nature in its real, true form, because that's where you get that sense of place, which is what I'm after in my paintings. So, but anyway, thanks for coming. And uh, if there's any questions, you can go ahead and ask them.